have this thing in my profession as, as curator. Uh, I've been curator at the Kirk Luther Museum in Redcar, and I've been here uh, in a Captain Cook capacity mainly, uh, how I started uh, with Middlesbrough. But I have this thing about, you know, there is no history on Teesside before 1850. You know, it all happened with the iron and steel works and, uh, and so on. Not true, <laughs> not true at all. So I do like these subject areas, like Captain Cook, uh, like the Civil War, that, that try and uh, turn the subject upside down a little bit. Uh, so I came to the Civil War subject because in a previous life, in, in my life in the Midlands, as a lad, I was quite interested in the Civil War in Leicestershire, which is where it all happened, of course, in the Midlands. Uh, and when I came up here, I started to get interested in the Civil War in the Northeast. And then, uh, it must have been a year, a couple of years ago, I was, I was talking to Robin uh, about the possibility of doing something. And I, I decided to develop a project uh, just at the time when the River Tees Rediscovered project was going, uh, st starting, uh, to do a project called The Northeast Turned Upside Down, which was a title based on a, uh, a 1646 tract about lamenting the demise of Christmas. And we were planning um, to stage a major exhibition on the Civil War in the Northeast next year. And I put all the letters out and I got all the visits uh, uh, teed up to go and uh, <coughs> look at some research material to, to sort out loans. And then George Osborne gave the museum service half a million pounds to develop a capital project at the Captain Cook Birthplace Museum. So I ended up in a position where I couldn't do both, and we have to do the capital project at the Cook. So the Northeast Turned Upside Down project is still there, but I've postponed it. It won't happen next year, but it will happen within the life of River Tees Rediscovered. I promise. So if anybody's offered any material, information, or help. In the meantime, just please bear with me. Um, as part of the work, starting to do the work for, for that project, I, I, I got a little talk together called The Northeast Turned Upside Down, uh, and it largely looked at um, what was going on in the Northeast and concentrating where appropriate on the Tees Valley, uh, particularly during the First Civil War. I haven't got to the Second and Third Civil Wars. Second Civil War, we really must have a look at because uh, particularly further to the north in uh, uh, County Durham uh, 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 and Northumberland, uh, there was quite a lot of activity. But I'm gonna look, <coughs> for our intents and purposes, mainly at the First Civil War. I'm not gonna go through chronologically, uh, you know, this happened then. And I'm, I'm gonna pick out various uh, aspects. And I, I am gonna look at the three battles. Now, I'm going to skip over Yarm, obviously, because I'm doing that this afternoon, but I will uh, mention uh, Gisborough and Piercebridge. And forgive me if, if I give you a little bit of background both to the, the period uh, and, and to uh, the warfare. Uh, Jeffrey's going to do more of that this afternoon, but for those of you who don't understand the different arms that were involved uh, on a battlefield, I will just briefly mention them. Uh, so, um, the, the area of study to do this project, to, to look at the Civil War, uh, wasn't just the Tees Valley, not, not just this narrow strip here in the middle. In fact, this, this map of the northeast doesn't go far enough north. Because to look at it, to put the Tees Valley in a proper context, we need to look at the area up as far as Berwick, basically, down as far as, uh, as Hull, and probably also bring in Newark as well, in, in Nottinghamshire, just further down as well. But this whole area we're going to look at, it's, a, it's like a three-tier uh, look at. Tees Valley in great detail, the northeast, uh, County Durham up to, up to Newcastle, uh, the north riding down to York as a secondary area, and then a third area, the, the, the broader. Um, and what we have in this area is basically an area in the First Civil War dominated by the Royalist, uh, people who sided with the Royalists, apart from pockets around <coughs> Hull, Scarborough, Whitby, so basically along this coast, and a very, very strong uh, pro-parliamentarian uh, area 
around the, the developing uh, industrial areas of Bradford, Leeds, Wakefield, Halifax, and so on. That's not to say people weren't royalist or parliamentarian in those other areas. Militarily, a lot of people backed out from it. A lot of people didn't participate militarily. Uh, and what I'm interested in are, is who, who, who was active militarily. And sorry, ladies, if you've come along wanting to know about the social history of the period and the ladies and the children and the families, I, I don't do that bit at the moment, though for the project, we will need to look at how people lived in the area uh, when basically the men folk were away fighting. That, you know, we have single parent families trying to make a living with marauding armies marching across the, the landscape. The men folk are away. They've got to get the crops in and, and keep the families fed and so on. So it's an important element, but I'm not going to deal with that, that here today. Uh, this is a, a portrait of an anonymous uh, uh, officer of the period. We don't know a great deal about the ordinary people who took part in the Civil War. There are a lot of names and faces we don't know about, the many thousands of men and women who went out on campaign or stayed at home and were affected by the war. <coughs> but we do have a number of accounts of people, some of them local, uh, who joined military units and went away and fought, uh, and also people who suffered at home by having their lands taken away, their positions, their estates, they were fined because they were on the wrong side. Uh, and um, I'm going to mention a, a, a couple of people, uh, uh, particularly with relevance to Yarm and Egglesford. Uh, there was a, we know about a Captain William Metcalf of Yarm who was a, a, originally a member of a foot regiment from Witten the Weir, uh, who even, eventually ended up in, uh, in, in the Yorkshire Cavalry, um, the Yorkshire Cavalry that went with the Queen uh, down to Oxford with supplies, fought at Newbury, fought at Marston Moor, became a delinquent. Uh, he had his uh, estates uh, in the arm taken off of him. Um, and we also know of uh, a Captain Garnet of Egglescliffe, who again went off to fight for the King's army uh, in a horse regiment. He had his lands taken away from him. Uh, but these are tantalizing glimpses. Uh, it would be great if we could find out a heck of a lot more. So, I'll go back. so broadly, the effects on the Northeast, um, although there, there was limited military activity, uh, there are only a few skirmishes, battles, encounters, there were lots and lots of soldiers and all their retinues tramping across the Tees Valley, and we'll see why uh, in a moment. We can't lose sight of the fact that while all this is going on, people have their daily, ordinary lives to lead, and they still, despite the war going on, still had to cope with poor harvests famine, disease. These were daily issues that people had to contend with. And for example, 1644, in Egglescliffe, 21 people died of the plague. Life went on. The northeast, our part of the northeast, was a great recruiting ground for the king. Very few parliamentarian regiments or units were raised in our area. Uh, and the men, largely, went off to fight. Sometimes they took their women folk with them. The men got wounded. They got killed in action and never came back. And they were lost to their families who had to pick up their lives and start again. There were military occupations. Troops were billeted and camped on the area. And I don't just mean English armies. I mean Scots armies as well. And not just during the British Civil War. Between the very much forgotten uh, Bishop's War uh, which was like a practice run, if you like, for the uh, for the English Civil Wars. I call them English Civil Wars, sorry, I shouldn't. They, they are British Civil Wars, uh, which came a few years later. And we have an, a military occupation which had a massive economic uh, effect uh, on, on the area. We also get a lot of change at this time because 
you know, the losers lose out. They lose their positions of influence in the community. Uh, the religious leaders of the community, the political leaders, the social leaders, they, they are all changed, largely. So the, very much, you get a change in the Northeast, the royalist sympathizers are thrown out, and the parliament put their own people in, in control. You get a lot of land exchange, forfeiture, destitution, taxation, uh, and penalties for being on the wrong side. And, as I mentioned before, you've got major problems, um, the old adage, an army marches on its stomach. Um, the local <coughs> areas were expected to provide voluntarily, with the promise of some recompense in the future, uh, food, supplies, horses, even equipment uh, to the armies, and very often, if they refused, it was taken anyway, it was stolen, it was robbed, and people suffered from that. So, very quick background, why did the country go through all this? Well, it was this guy's fault, wasn't it? Charles I, uh, arguably the cause of the war. Uh, you know, how could he go wrong? I mean, his, his, his background is Scottish, you know, we, we, uniting the two kingdoms, um, and, and he messes up. He upsets the Scots and the Irish big time uh, before the Civil War. He creates grave suspicion from the Parliament. Uh, he upsets people on a religious front. Uh, he takes on what the Parliament views as evil councillors, people like uh, uh, Wentworth, uh, Strafford, uh, his advisors, both and Lord, um, uh, his advisors, both political and religious, are seen as the wrong flavour. They're very high church, uh, very pro uh, absolute monarchy. Uh, he's rubbish with money. He's always asking for money, and when he can't get his way, he gets rid of the parliament and he imposes his own taxation. He revises old tax uh, uh, regulations and rules, which, which, which people object to. Uh, he gets into conflict with the Irish, his Irish subjects, he gets into conflict with the Scottish subjects, and at the end of it all, he's seeming to be creating, raising armies that he wants to use against his terrible subjects in Ireland and Scotland, but Parliament suspects he secretly wants to use the army against the Parliament um, and his own subjects in England. These are all broad generalisations, but you get the picture. Okay, now this time is, 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 despite the stability of the early Stuart rule, it's still a time of uncertainty, <coughs> and we're still making preparations for those terrible dark days. And, and, and there are plans uh, in 1638 uh, for Hartlepool, this is uh, a figure very kindly supplied to me by, by Robin, of the proposals uh, for the town of Hartlepool, which already had uh, the remnants of its medieval defences, but like most towns of the period, most towns, uh, their medieval fortifications, because we've had relative times of peace, have fallen into disrepair. They were, they were fairly useless anyway, because they were built at a time when largely artillery wasn't in use, uh, so that they're not fit for purpose. So you get plans, even at this time, the, the great one in the 16th century is, of course, in the northeast, very massive fortifications for, for artillery pieces, mainly because we still have people uh, over the border who was still troublesome. Uh, uh, to, sorry for any Scots uh, uh, <laughs> sitting here. But they were in trouble. Yeah, no, no, no. Bones about it. Uh, and, and at Hartlepool, even in 1638, there were schemes to uh, create, these were some schemes that were never developed or, 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 or created, uh, to put uh, artillery type fortifications uh, around the settlement. Uh, and we do know that in the Civil War there, there, there were royalist regiments uh, garrisoning the town. I'm, I'm going to mention this one of these units uh, in, in the second talk. Hilton's reg Regiment of Foot, uh, which was, was lar largely, uh, largely garrisoned uh, places in the northeast. It, it didn't go away to fight like, like some of the units. Uh, and then further north, um, we have this sort of precursor to the Civil War, 
which is which is the bishops' war. The king tries to impose his religious uh, uh, beliefs uh, and practices uh, through the, the prayer book and so on onto the Scottish people, which is severely resisted by, by the Scottish. And they sign a covenant, become known as the Covenanters. And, and, and the king sends an army up to the north of England to, to go into Scotland and to teach the Scots to be obedient. But he bites off more than he can chew because the Scots are very, very well organized. Their, their army is probably better organized. And despite all these uh, talk of the, the horrible Scots coming down, raping, looting, and pillaging. They were a pretty disciplined army as well, very effective. Uh, and um, there were two wars, the first Bishop's War, the uh, second Bishop's War, and we came off, the English, we, <laughs> uh, came off really, really badly in both of them, uh, and ended up being absolutely trounced at the Battle of Newburn, uh, just to the west of Newcastle. In, in, in the Second War. Uh, there was an exhibition at Newcastle Discovery a few years ago about the uh, Civil War uh, <coughs> around the Newcastle area and uh, the siege of, of Newcastle. And, and in the exhibition was, was this uh, plan of a, um, an encampment that um, the Royalist army set up uh, on the banks of the Tweed. Now this, this has a I'm going to get this the wrong way around. I think this is Scotland, uh, and Berwick is off that way, I think. It's, it's weird. It's, it's a weird way around. But anyway, this is the, it's, this is the Royal Encampment, with all the regiments camped around um, this defending area uh, uh, with the artillery down here. And Q, that they're all lettered up, all the regiments are lettered up. Q is a local regiment. This is Sir William Penniman's Regiment of Foot. And that was a regiment that was raised in mask uh, and uh, was, was one of the earliest regiments to be raised in the Civil War uh, later on uh, and had quite a distinguished um, uh, service or record. Anyway. Jeff, you've been talking about the Battlefield Trust. The, the, the Trust have done a lot of work at Newman Ford. Uh, if you go there, I think I've never been to my shame, uh, but there are uh, interpretation panels uh, telling you about the battlefield. It was fought basically over at the Ford, uh, over the river, uh, and basically stops on the north side at Newbourne. English in prepared positions to some extent on the south side, and the English were just swept away. It was, a, it was an absolute disaster. And as a result of that, the Scots moved down <coughs> through uh, County Durham. And in the Treaty of Ripon that was established, uh, the military border between the Scots to the north and the English to the south became the River Tees. And as part of uh, the concessions that were wrung out of the English by the Scots, uh, the English had to pay the Scots army £850 a day to pay for their army to occupy the lands to the north of the River Tees. The concession that the English got was that they were allowed to, to retain a garrison in the castle of <coughs> Stockton to the north of the River Tees and also an emplacement just to the north of the River Tees at Egglescliffe. They were the only two places that they could retain north of the River Tees. Um, and that, that sort of <coughs> created the picture of, 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 of what was going to happen uh, in, in the Civil War to come. Sorry, this is the, the 1770s Jeffreys map, uh, much, much, much later in the Civil War, but just it's a much clearer uh, map just to give you an idea of, of, of the important area we're going to be looking at particularly. So uh, this is a view from Yarm across the River Tees towards Egglesford. Somewhere on the other side of this bridge was uh, some kind of English royalist encampment, which was built on and developed, we think, uh, in, in the later Civil War, a couple of years later. And of course, the uh, 
there was the castle at Stockton, which I think, again, on the Jeffreys map, was, was in this area here. Yeah? Um, and we don't really have a good view of what the castle looked like. I, I think, talking to Robin, uh, probably the, the best standing similar structure to Stockton Castle that we, we can hazard a guess at what Stockton looked at from these, these drawings that we have surviving from a later date um, uh, was, was probably uh, Castle Bolton, which you, you probably all know. Uh, it was probably a structure like that. But they were allowed to garrison this. And in the Civil War, uh, a couple of years later, uh, the Royalists uh, garrisoned this. And the castle, when it was captured at the end of the First Civil War, uh, was, the troops were taken out and the castle was slighted. It was completely removed from the landscape, apart from a few more domestic buildings. Now, I have mentioned uh, the um, Pennyman's Regiment. Oh, sorry, what I should have said about Newburn Ford. This, this colours uh, what we uh, will come on to uh, in, with, with regard to one of the, the, the prime parliamentarian uh, commanders who went on to lead the New Model Army. Sir Thomas Fairfax, and a lot of parliamentarian uh, sympathisers who joined the parliamentarian army when, when the Civil War broke out, fought with the king. They were loyal subjects of the king and, and changed to the parliament because they were so exasperated with him. But Sir Thomas Fairfax uh, was part of that army that went into Scotland and <coughs> Newburn Ford. And there's a lovely quote uh, about what happened after Newburn New Ford. The whole army did run with so great precipitation that Sir Thomas Fairfax, who had a command in it, did not stick to his own, that till he passed the T's, his legs trembled under him. So uh, it shows how awful it, 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 it was. Anyway, when, when war declared, um, the, the majority of uh, the, the, the nobles, the gentry, the landowners, uh, signed it with the king in, in this part of the northeast. And as I mentioned, one of the really active participants uh, were, were the Pennyman family of Mass Corps uh, and of Ormsby Hall. Mm -hmm. So William Pennyman, uh, who raised a regiment for the king uh, for the Bishop's Wars, uh, revived the regiment, uh, and his uh, famous blue coats, uh, and there is a sealed knot uh, unit that reenacts uh, under the name of uh, Pennyman's Regiment. There they are, uh, marching. Um, Pennyman's Regiment, just to give you an idea of the contribution of local men, most of the, the men in Pennyman's Regiment, infantry regiment, something up to a thousand men, were raised on his estate lands. He had estate lands at Mask and dotted about the northeast. Uh, this was one of the first engagements where First Wars where people were prepared to move away from their area. They didn't stick and defend their, their town or their county. The armies moved around uh, across political boundaries. And Pennyman's Regiment, to, just to give you some idea, <coughs> it, it went with the king from Mask, York, when the king moved from York in August, it moved with him south to Oxford. Uh, and between August and December, 1642, the first few months of the year uh, of the campaign, this regiment marched over 400 miles. Uh, it got about a bit. It must have been quite uh, a, a tiring experience for them. And they fought uh, in two major engagements. Uh, they fought at Edge Hill, and they also fought at the Battle of Marlborough as well. So, the king raised his standard, uh, people didn't exactly flock to his standard at Nottingham when he raised it. There's a contemporary engraving of it to start with. But gradually he ma amassed quite a force uh, and there were major engagements uh, at, at Powick Bridge, one of the early cavalry engagements, uh, Edge Hill. And the inconclusive action at Edge Hill allowed the king to move his main field army and threaten London there was a battle at Brentford, and then the train bands of London turned out 
and deterred <coughs> the king from marching on London and the city. He turned back and the armies went into winter quarters, the parliament based on London and the royalists on Oxford. And by the way, Sir William Pennyman uh, was governor of Oxford, uh, the capital, the royalist capital, for eight months during 1643. He sadly died in, in, in Oxford in, in August 1643. That was his importance. Now, in all this time, um, what's going on in the North? Well, the North was important because um, it was not only pretty loyal to the king, but it was also one of the few places that the royalists could bring in supplies of arms, armour, equipment, and even troops and leaders such as Prince Rupert. Prince Rupert landed at Tynemouth from the continent. Uh, he was a German prince. Uh, he'd been fighting in the Thirty Years War <coughs> in Europe. Uh, and he was the king's nephew, uh, along with his brother Morris. And he landed at Tynemouth and rode from Tynemouth to join the king at Coventry overnight. A hard ride down from Newcastle mm. overnight to Coventry. Um, and at some point he would have crossed the River Tees. Quite where he crossed the Tees, we don't know. Um, but we get people uh, coming from the continent, supplies and arms, and we get people like Newcastle, the Earl of Newcastle, um, who was probably the, the most important royalist leader in the Northeast. He also <coughs> had lands, of course, down in the Midlands in Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire. But he focused his attentions on, on the Northeast, and he was the main royalist leader. He amassed a very famous uh, regiment of, of, of foot soldiers called Newcastle and White Coast that were destroyed at Marston Moor. But he largely led the Northeast forces for the king against the parliament. Uh, one of the strange things about the war is that uh, when people declared, the navy declared for the parliament. And the navy uh, embarked on a blockade of all the ports, particularly on the east coast, to stop royalist arms supplies coming in. Uh, in doing that, the blockade also meant that the coal ships from Tynemouth and Newcastle down to London also found it difficult to supply coal to the city, which put the uh, northeast coalfield miners out of work and led its thoughts to many of them joining Newcastle's army uh, to fight against the Parliament. So it was a, a, a real cyclical uh, kind of thing. Anyway, with um, Newcastle um, were a whole host of uh, people who raised regiments, and against him, based on that, um, in that area in West Yorkshire, were the Fairfaxes. They were the main parliamentarian leaders of the Parliament. And this is uh, Ferdinando Fairfax, the father, and this is his more famous son, Sir Thomas Fairfax, who ran with the rest of the army after Newburgh Ford. And he became uh, head of the parliamentary New Model Army uh, after its formation. And he's largely been overshadowed by the man whose name we shall not mention today, Mr. O.C. Um, he's totally forbidden today, I'm afraid. I forgot to mention that at the start of the session. Um, and, and there are various other interesting characters, uh, some of whom changed sides uh, or, or got into <coughs> the water with the side that they were supposed to be playing with. Uh, the gentleman on the left hand side is Sir John Hotham, uh, father, uh, senior, and there was also John Hotham, junior, both very active parliamentarians, based mainly on Hull, and Sir John the father famously. Uh, prevented, uh, refused admittance to Charles I before the Civil War broke out to Hull, and then also successfully maintained Hull um, against the King's armies when they tried to besiege it. Hull was a major, major uh, magazine uh, of powder, uh, shot, uh, and arms. And it was seized, like the Tower of London and the other armies, mainly down south, by the Parliament. And that's why the king had to bring so much material in from Europe 
and also why he was mad keen to get his hands on the ball uh, and put the ball in positions. Hotham wasn't totally loyal to the parliament and both he and his son eventually uh, lost their heads because of that. The other guy is very interesting. Uh, this is Sir Hugh Chomley, uh, seen here in, in, in three-quarter armour, looking very grand. Sir Hugh Chomley was based mainly on Scarborough, and he actually got away with changing sides. He was a very uh, staunch uh, parliamentarian supporter in the early years of, of the war. And then very soon after the Battle of Gisborough, uh, which I'll be coming on to talk about very soon, um, he changed sides, was appalled by the carnage, thought that the best bet was to go with the king, changed sides, and, and fought very successfully, ultimately, not successfully, obviously, because he was on the losing side, uh, for the king, uh, particularly at the, at the very important siege of Scarborough uh, in, 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 after the period of, of Marston Moor. Very, very quickly, I don't want to steal Jeffrey's thunder about the, the tactics. What we're talking about <coughs> is warfare based on three main arms. We're talking about uh, warfare based on ordnance, what we call artillery today, foot, which are the infantry, and the horse, which are the cavalry. And in a big you know, set piece pitch battle like Marston Moor, generally, very generally, you'd have your infantry formations in the middle of an army, these are the two opposing armies. The flanks were usually covered by the cavalry and either grouped together in batteries or dispersed between particularly the infantry units. You get the ordnance, you get the guns uh, uh, mounted. And the idea was just to blast away, soften people up, or uh, sweep, send your cavalry in, sweep the, the enemy's cavalry away, and then engage your foot. Uh, Sorry, it's very, very simplistic. I don't want to go into too much detail. But basically, you can have utter confusion on a battlefield. Uh, Richard's talked about the, the smoke and the noise. Black powder makes a hell of a lot of uh, smoke on, on, on the battlefield. Visibility goes down. You've got troops wearing virtually the same uniforms, equipment. You get red regiments on the Parliament side. You get red regiments on the... Uh, royalist side, uh, you get uh, the standards that you're supposed to rally to, you know, they, they're usually the same colour as the coats that the troops wore, though not necessarily. So Pennyman's regiment wore blue coats, but they had green standards. But you get a lot of confusion on the battlefield uh, with all this going on. Um, and Basically, you have your foot formations consisting of your pikemen supported by your musketeers. They looked a bit like this. These are your musketeers. Big 18 foot long pikes. Musketeers carrying either a, a, a matchlock or a flintlock kind of weapon. Your pikemen in the early days of the war could be armoured um, with helmets, breastplates, backplates, not necessarily. And then you've got your cavalry, various types of cavalry, light cavalry, hardly any armor, just wearing their civilian clothes almost. They might have a buff coat on. Uh, they might wear armor. They could be the big boys. They could, these are very expensive soldiers to put on a field. Um, these are the karaziers or lobsters. They wore three-quarter armor, but they were largely being phased out by the stage. Most of all, you get the typical cavalrymen. By the way, Royalists, floppy hats, long hair, elaborate clothing, round heads, pot helmets, short, cropped hair, door. Don't believe a word of it. The generalization. There was a real mishmash of, of, of uniforms, uh, dress, and, and appearance. Uh, these are your standard cavalry troopers uh, of the time with the pot helmet, the breast and back plate, and the buff coats. And this guy is chosen not to have a pot helmet, he's got just a floppy hat. So they're the kind of guys, dragoons are largely mounted infantry, they ride to battle, but they usually fight on foot with a musket, uh, which has a, a, a far greater range than a carbine or a pistol. If you want to see this kind of armor, it's here on your doorstep. This is the armor from the Kirkleatham Parish Armory. 
some of it's on display uh, at Kirkley and Paul uh, Old Hall Museum. You've got uh, lobster pot helmets, breastplates. The piece you can't see, sadly, because it, when this collection was sold, we weren't able to buy the whole collection. The, the pikeman's armor and helmet <coughs> went to a collector in America, sadly. Uh, but the other great collection of arms and armor of this period is in Preston Hall Museum. And if you want to go further afield, um, China and Wear Museums have stuff. And of course, there's the Royal Armories at Leeds, where you'll see a massive cross section of this stuff. Now, I mentioned um, the, the, the need for the Royalists to bring arms and armor and supplies into the Northeast. One of the greatest uh, uh, active people for bringing stuff into the country was the king's wife, Queen Henrietta Maria. She actually went over to Holland uh, and, and bought lots of supplies and equipment, attracted a lot of personnel, officers, well-trained officers, uh, well-experienced ex officers from the continent who had been fighting in the Thirty Years' War. Uh, and she met um, all the great and the good uh, in, in Holland, in Amsterdam, and brought over supplies of ships that ran the gauntlet of the parliamentary blockade and landed a lot of the stuff at Tynemouth. And her great convoy came in at Bridlington eventually um, to the east of York. But this is important. This, this connection between the continent and Tynemouth is important because from Tynemouth, those royalist supply convoys had to get south to York, which was the, the main royalist headquarters, and eventually to Oxford, the capital, to supply the main royalist field armies. And that's why the River Tees became so important. Uh, this is a view of uh, an artist's uh, representation later than the Civil War, obviously, of an arms convoy that had just arrived at York, going through one of the bars of York. Big convoys. Uh, convoys of powder, shot, arms and armor, pistols, weapons, uh, convoys of wagons, covered wagons, mules, horses, uh, and these are heavily guarded by cavalry, infantry, and dragoons. And they all come in massive convoys down Deer Street, uh, from Newcastle, through County Durham, through Durham, keeping to the safe towns and cities on the way down the settlements, to Stockton, to Yarm, to Pierce Bridge, and down onto York. And this is the type of thing you will see moving through the countryside. This is a, a representation of the period, quite stylized, of your, your core infantry formations with their baggage wagons, their supplies, their artillery, flanked by the cavalry units. They would have sent uh, forward units out to wrecky the ground before they, they trundled on down the roads across the fields. And one of these early supply convoys, uh, sorry, one of these early convoys of uh, troops came down Deer Street and came and tried to cross the river of Pierce Bridge on the 1st of December 1642. And that was Newcastle's army which had been called by the people of York. The people of York were being threatened by Sir Hugh Cholmley and by Fairfax. And they wanted uh, support, which they got from Newcastle. He trundled down the road with a force of about 8,000 soldiers, which is a big mass of people. Uh, they had wagons, they had carts, they had ordnance. And this is an aerial view of Pierce, which today is the River Tees, here's the bridge, the medieval bridge that they went over was, was just half the width of the present bridge, you'll have to imagine, and here's the main road coming down uh, through what is now the village of Pierce Bridge, uh, and basically what you had was a small unit of parliamentarian infantry, horse, dragoons on the other side of the river, and it was their job to hold this force up and stop it getting to York. Well, to use the terminology of, of the period, it was a forlorn hope. They had no chance of stopping a unit of this size uh, reaching York. Uh, what the Royalists did, they set, set up an artillery position 
on Concrete Hill and blasted the parliamentarian forces on the higher ground overlooking the river. Uh, uh, no doubt uh, there was a barricade over the bridge to stop the force trying to get uh, across the bridge. But it was hopeless. Sorry, there's, there's a few uh, looking the other way. So the Royalists come down uh, Deer Street. They set up the artillery positions on Carberry Hill. Here's the bridge. And, and whether the parliamentarians had forces in the village, such as, such as it was there, we don't know. But their main positions were here on the other side of the river, probably guns on the other side of the bridge. Um, and it was all over in a very, very short time. Um, you can imagine, I don't know whether there were houses there at the time, uh, probably not as substantial as these ones, but this is the, the view that the Royalist forces would have had approaching the bridge, uh, and this is the view that the poor parliamentarian forces, the media forces, would have had uh, overlooking the bridge uh, towards the Royalists. I say it was all over very, very quickly, uh, and the Royalists didn't have it all their own way. Um, they had uh, men killed, not in vast numbers, but they had a colonel of a regiment killed, Colonel Howard, who's buried in uh, Iconoscliff Church, uh, and there's a memorial in his home church uh, over in the, in, in, in the Lake District uh, to him. So that was the first uh, big engagement in our area. And I, I'm, I'm saying that's not a skirmish, that is a battle. There was set preparation by the parliamentarians to stop this unit coming down the road. Uh, and, and the unit coming down the road had a main objective of forcing the road through, which they did. We know where that battle was. The bridge was the focus. In the case of the Battle of Hillsborough, we don't know where it was, and, and we have to have uh, uh, make a, 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 a guess as to what happened at Hillsborough. Basically, you've got Sir Hugh Chomley and his parliamentarian forces engaging the Royalists around York. And they get to hear that a big supply convoy has landed in Tynemouth, and they're going to trundle this convoy down the road again to York. He gets wind that the Royalists have sent a colonel called Colonel Guildford Slingsby, who previously been in Ireland as secretary uh, to the Earl of Stratford. Uh, he'd come over to his Hemlington estates and was raising, sorry, Hemlington, for those of you who don't know, Hemlington's just to the south of Middlesbrough. On his Hemlington estates, he was trying to raise a regiment of foot to support the voyage, the, the journey of this supply convoy across the Tees and down to York. Hearing this, Sir Hugh Chomley set off with about 500 soldiers, a mixture of cavalry, infantry and dragoons, from Moulton, where he was based at that time, and his troops in mid-January, we don't know what the weather was like, but they made an almost direct line of march across the North York Moors to Gisborough. It's a journey of nearly 40 miles. They took all their equipment with them. They would have had to have taken food uh, uh, and all their shot and powder. Plus, we think that they dragged some guns with them as well, probably two field, small field pieces. And they went to Gisborough. This is a 1780s view of, of, of Westgate looking towards the Priory Gisborough. We don't have any pictures uh, from the 1640s of Gisborough, sadly. Um, and uh, we think that Sir Hugh Chomley uh, led his forces across the moors, across Blakey Ridge, from Moulton, by the way, across the ridge here, past the Lion Inn, having a pint or two, probably, no, you wouldn't have done with it. Um, uh, this is a view of some Dutch soldiers. You can imagine the scene, mid-January. Um, I think they missed the worst of the weather. I think the bad weather came slightly afterwards. And they probably came down off the moors, either um, around the area of uh, Bellman's Bank, uh, they probably went through uh, Westerdale, down through Bellman's Bank, or they probably went down Burke Brow uh, in the Slatewalk area. We don't know. And I've got two ideas as to where the battle might have been. Either 
on the Bellman Bank side, <coughs> just off the moors, because we know that the Royalist, Musk, the Royalist forces put out their musketeers uh, and aligned the hedges and the ditches uh, about a mile uh, to the south of the town, or they might have lined up uh, in this area to, to stop them uh, as they came off the moors uh, through the slate bar. I don't know. It's some investigation that we have to do. But basically, fairly evenly matched forces. The engagement uh, took about uh, a couple of hours, and in that engagement, uh, the, the Royalist uh, forces that were very green troops, that had only been, just been, been raised by Guildford Slingsby, were cut to pieces. Uh, Guildford Slingsby, the Royalist commander, had both of his legs amputated above the knee, um, and it took him three days to die in Gisborough. His body was taken away by his mother and buried in York Minster. Uh, and the troops that surrendered, didn't manage to get away on the Royalist side, were taken back by the parliamentarians, uh, either to Scarborough or back to, to Moulton. Now, the force, parliamentarian force at, at Gisborough, the successful force, either went back to Moulton or, or Scarborough and came back again, or Chomley sent the largest part of his force on to Yarm. Now, I'm not going to talk about that, but a few days later, after the 16th of January, on the 1st of February, there was another engagement when the convoy coming from Newcastle tried to go over Yarm Bridge. That's the talk for this afternoon. Okay. <laughs> so they're the three main engagements in our area. They're not massive, but they are proper battles. And, and I feel that there's, there's still a lot of work to do out there, um, and, and, and we need to find out more. Basically, the way the war went, the Royalists continued to have the upper hand in the north. Uh, they inflicted a major defeat on, on, on the parliamentarians at Adwater Moor, a sort of the North's forgotten battle. Uh, but sadly, um, early 1644, the Scots entered the war, obviously invading from the North, which took attention away, the attention of Newcastle away from the South. He had to defend the North against the Scots. And that was largely the downfall of the Royalists uh, as, as the parliamentarians got the, the upper hand. 1644, Master Moore, it all started to fall apart. So you get these very, very skilled, very, very professional units of Scots uh, coming down in great numbers. The army was about 20,000 strong. It was a big army. Um, and the one thing I'll put in here is one of the great sites in the Northeast that you really should go and have a look at. And it always appalls me that English heritage don't make more of it. Uh, you, you go to a lot of these castles and battlefield sites and people say, oh, oh, cease came and knocked down this castle, slighted this castle, or this fortification at the end of the Civil War, uh, and that's why it's in a ruin. If you go to Scarborough and Scarborough Castle, you'll actually see a castle and a keep that was blown down in a siege. It's, it's an absolutely amazing sight. I effervesce about it all the time. If you go to Scarborough today, it's very unassuming seaside town, but there's lots of evidence for what went on there. You walk down this street, what it says, Bar Street. What was across here? A bar, a gate. Scarborough was a fortified town. It wasn't a very powerful fortified town. It fell very quickly to the parliamentarians. But the castle was something else. Up on the hill here, you can just see the walls in the background. Scarborough Castle was a major thorn in the parliamentarian side. Not once, not twice, but three times. Three sieges, I think, of, of Scarborough Castle. The first Civil War siege is a classic. There's blood, there's guts, there's gore. It's nasty. If you go there today, I really think it's undersold. There's a graphic panel. There's a few cannonballs in a showcase. Uh, there's some reconstructions of the views from the castle. What, this is a lovely reconstruction from the castle walls looking down on the parish church. Interesting landmark, because if you go there today, the chancel of the parish church is not there anymore. Same view today. There are a few 
sticky up bits where the chancel stood. That's because <coughs> when the parliamentarians besieged this castle, they stuck their big siege gun in the chancel of the church, poked its muzzle out the church window, and blasted the walls of the castle. And what do you think the royalists did? They fired back and smashed the chancel down. Uh, there we go, there's a, there's a closer up detail of it there. So don't just go to the castle, go and visit the church. It's not very exciting inside, but uh, from a civil war point of view, it's, 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 a, it's a fascinating sight. Um, and the reason the siege was so awful is that the, the, the people besieged blocked up the town gate, the, the castle gate, and the wars and the sally ports so badly that when they surrendered, the parliamentarians actually had to make a breach in the wall to let the soldiers out. They couldn't get through the gates. Uh, this, is, this is the main gate. That's the approach up to the, to the gate. Uh, and uh, this is an artist's reconstruction of what happened in the middle of the first siege, and that's the side of the Norman keep, which came tumbling down because it had been blasted uh, by the parliamentarians. And that's what it looks like today if you go there. So a real must, a real must if you're interested in the Civil War. And up to the end of the First Civil War, it was a story of small units of royalists fleeing battles, holding up in strongholds like Skipton. Go and see Skipton. Skipton is fascinating. <coughs> There's the gate house that you see in the, the famous courtyard with the tree in it. But if you go inside the castle, um, you'll see the walls that were, were, were smashed down in the Civil War, but surprisingly, they were allowed to build the walls back up on condition that they didn't build them the same thickness. So if there was ever trouble again, they could um, easily smash the walls down. Uh, they weren't built to the same thickness. And I don't know who that is, uh, Castle Bolton. Go and have a look at Castle Bolton. Castle Bolton had a, a, had a terrible time as a siege as well. Uh, go and have a look at that. So there's a flavour. Um, I hope I've given you a sort of insight into potentially how exciting the Civil War uh, and looking at it and the study of it could be in our area. Uh, as I say, I've only concentrated on the military side. I'd really like to look at the social history side, <coughs> what the women folk were doing, what, what people was, how people went about their daily lives with all this going on around them, armies trouncing across the T's, backwards and forwards. Um, we were part of the Civil War. It was horrible, short, brutish, and nasty. Okay, thank you. Right, uh, thank you, Bill, for telling us uh, an excellent overview that covered just about everything, I think. Um, not the Battle of Yarn. No, not the Battle of Yarn, no, we've got that to look forward to. Um, we've got time for a, a brief question, but uh, we'll probably have more time to ask you. Does anybody have anything further to ask? I have to add something to what Phil was saying, and, and uh, he's right, the Battle of the Trust of we've got a big project running at Newburn Hall that, uh, that Phil spoke about. We've also got a project running in Sunderland, which, if you like, is very similar because there's no massive battles happening in and around Sunderland. But there are a number of small skirmishes, lots of interesting things. And on the parliamentarian <coughs> side, most of the stuff that's happening on Sunderland is 1644, after the Scots came in January 1644. Um, certainly, as we move forward here on the T side and at Newburn and at Sunderland, there is scope at some point in the future to try and knit them all together because it's all part of the same story. It's the same Scottish covenant as largely. And to turn this into a sort of northeast project linking Newcastle, Sunderland, and Teesside because it's, it is all just different facts in the same story. Yeah, thank you. Right. That's, I guess. Um, I live in Gisborne. There's talk um, locally of the Battle of Stumps Cross. Um, Possible association with history. The chap who lost his legs. Um, is this just a flimsy legend with no foundation? Yes. I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, 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 I forget who it was. Wrote about Stumps Cross and and and, and talked about Stumps Cross in in association with an earlier early medieval uh, engagement in which somebody lost their legs. I think it it, it is strange that. Gilbert Slingsby ended up with stumps for legs, and there is 
a Stump's Cross. I think Stump's Cross is, is, is later. I, I, I don't think there was a Stump's Cross in the 1640s. I think it's an 18th century um, stone marker. In Gisborough, the, the attempt to pinpoint the location of the battle uh, has been done through a field called War Field. A War Field, if you can imagine, those of you who know Gisborough, if you drive out of Gisborough along Red Car Road and you come to the T junction where the hospital and the police station were, are, uh, uh, and then you turn right as though you're going to the roundabout near Lawrence Jackson School. Right, if you go along that road on the right hand side, there's a big housing estate, isn't there? War fields were where those houses are built now. And the, there is a record of a cannonball being found in that field. Now, initially, I, I poo pooed that, saying, oh, there were, there's no record of any ar artillery being used at the Battle of Gisborough. But there's a later account of the Battle of Gisborough which refers to cannon and which refers to uh, cannon being involved in the death of Gilbert Slingsby in, in being hit with, with, with this hail shot, um, hence the cutting off of his legs. Um, now, whether the battle uh, developed so that it took place in the fields to the south of Gisborough and then moved on through the town or the outskirts of the town and finished off at Warfield where there was a big surrender or what, we don't know. But yeah, there are th those two sites, Stump Cross and Warfield, that are associated, but that's all we know.